So last time, so I'm really excited to once again share with you guys to think together. Once again, like I said last time, I am not the guy thinking of this stuff. I am just channeling information. Can you see that okay or is it too light? No. It's not as it's not as crisp as our as our uh, projector, but it'll have to do. Um, if you guys can't see it, we can try and change the color, but we're okay. Well, we might start falling asleep if it, if we turn the lights down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is this my coffee? Where's my coffee? Is that my coffee? Man, you know, I thought I was prepared. I thought I, I was here at like four o'clock. I thought I had everything, and then like six. 15 hits and I'm like, shoot, I still have all this and this and this. So um, this truth that we're going to talk about today, just like last time, I'm just channeling. I'm sharing what we're reading in, in our schooling and some of the best guys that are shaping us. And I, it's just amazing, amazing truth. But it does require us to think. So last time we talked about, we're kind of doing this as a series, this theology conversation that we're having, theology lesson. The first time we basically asked the question, why is theology important? Uh, and how do I correctly view biblical knowledge so that I'm receiving God's truth and not becoming puffed up and prideful, but that uh, I'm growing in love for God? So if you didn't get convinced that you need to study theology, that you need to study God's word, then you should go back and rewatch those. But today we move on. So why is theology important or the foundation of theology? Today we're asking, what is the focus of all theology? And this is really one of the things that we kind of addressed last time where we said, the problem when we get all prideful and we learn biblical truth but we don't grow is because our focus is wrong. We are learning for our own pride and ego we are not using God's truth as a means to know God himself. And so the focus of all theology is God. Through every truth in the Bible, we, are, we, we get to know God more. That's why God's word is amazing. And so every doctrine we study in the Bible, every truth, every Bible verse that we're studying, every part of the story that you're studying, the whole point is to fall in love with God more. And to know him and to love him more. So at the center of everything, we want to spend some time today and think about God. Now, the subject of God is so vast, so massive, right? What, what are we going to cover in two 40-minute conversations? Not even scratching the surface. That's what we're going to do today. We're not even going to scratch the surface. But hopefully we'll sketch out a vision of what the Bible teaches about God and Hopefully, we will be challenged. Even as we're barely scratching the surface, I hope this information is going to be challenging, not just lightweight. And it's not lightweight. Um, so you should expect to work hard to follow along, uh, to engage your thinking, to engage your heart, to look at the full picture of what we're seeing uh, when we look at God. When we think about the doctrine of God, um, there's no other doctrine that is more important. So we're talking about the fact that all theology leads to God, but also our doctrine of God is at the very center of everything we do and think. The beginning of when the church falls apart is when the church loses sight of God. In our own Christian lives, you know, you can be going through the motions of Christianity, you could be living your spiritual life, doing all the right stuff, but if you don't if, if we lose a vision of God, if we lose a sense of God, of, of, of Him present in our life, of, of a clear understanding of who God is, when you lose a sense of God, a vision of God, a knowledge of God, you lose the whole Christianity. So, at the very center is our vision of God, and so that's what we're going to try to cultivate today, is a vision of God. We're going to skip that That'll be for the follow-up bonus conversation, but we don't have time for that. So, the focus of all theology is God himself. The more, most important thing that we must know and study is God. 
So, in today's study, I kind of broke it into two topics. Uh, the first lesson is to see him as creator and Lord. And the most, um, most of our time, we're going to focus on this second piece, Lord. So our goals in this first section is to understand the centrality, the importance. If any of the words that I'm using don't make sense, just holler. If you have a question in the middle of anything I'm saying, just speak. Um, we're all here to kind of converse and to talk and to think out loud. I'm working on two computers here, so I'm like, I'm flipping the slides here, but I'm, I also have to remember to flip the slides here. Um, a couple of goals here. To understand the importance of the creator-creature distinction. Why is that important? Creator-creature. One of the most important things in all of Christianity, one of the most important things in all of Christian history. Why is that important? Also, to understand the meaning of God's lordship. What is it that it says that he is Lord? What does that mean? And to know ourselves in light of his lordship. So one of the most important things, oh yeah, we got a, we got a pointer, <laughs> is to know what does it mean that he is Lord and what does it mean that we are living under his lordship. So, first of all, creator and creature. When you look at the biblical picture of God, one of the most clear and defining pieces of the Christian worldview, can you see it okay, is is um, that the Bible presents a very, very clear and unbridgeable line between creator and creature. So the two are completely separate. The two are completely distinct, right? So when you look, for example, in Genesis, um, let's see here. In Genesis, it starts with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And through the whole Bible, we have a, a clear distinction between God and the universe. So why is this important to us as we're thinking about Christian truth? First of all, creation is out of nothing. We've heard that. We, we just studied Genesis, and it's a really quick refresher, but it's very important. Creation is out of nothing. So what does that mean? It means that the whole world, all of us, everything that we see, everything that we know... Everything that exists is completely separate from the Creator and completely dependent upon the Creator. So everything hangs on Him as Creator. Christianity is the only religion that maintains a full distinction between Creator and Creature. So if you look at um, different religions, you know, the, the, the mysticism of today, like, like Eastern mysticism is now making, becoming very popular in our culture today. Meditation, Buddhism, all these ideas where the universe and God are, are, are intermixed and connected. Um, so, th because there's a failure to distinguish between the two. Or, in, if you have like atheism, or in the past, when people believed in deism, which means that God is way out there and so far and separate that we can't even know Him, so we can't really know anything true about God. And that fails to, that fails to have a clear creator-creature distinction because we can't really know anything about God. So all of our ideas come from us, which makes God sort of dependent on us. So the Bible presents all of creation, everything that we are, everything that is created, completely distinct. And because God is distinct, because God is totally separate, God relates to us. God has a specific kind of relationship to the universe. So, what is God's relationship to the universe? And that brings us to the idea of lordship. So, Exodus chapter 3, verses 13, 14, and 15. We, we've seen this many times. Notice specifically... When Moses is asking God, how do I describe you? You're, you're talking to me out of a burning bush. How do I describe you? And of all the different ways that God could have described himself, God chooses one central name. And that name defines God through all of Scripture. And that is Lord. 
Um, so let's read this together. I'll just read it out loud. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? And the, the significance of a name, you might recall, the significance of a name is the fact that the name of God defines his nature. The name of God describes what kind of God is he. And here, here's what God says. He, God says, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent you. This is my name forever, the name which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. So we see two things, right? God says, I am who I am. I am the self-existent God. So you cannot compare me to any of the gods of the Egyptians. You cannot compare me to any of the gods of their, of their ideas and worldviews because their gods all interrelated. Their gods had different fights and quarrels. And God says here, it's unrelated to anyone. I am of myself. And then God says, the Lord. And when you see that in your English Bibles, in capitalized, all caps, that's the Hebrew name that we translate as pronounced Yahweh or the Lord. So that's the name that God gives himself. Out of this description, out of this description, God says, I am who I am. I am completely independent. And out of that description, God says, my name is Yahweh. My name is the Lord. So, what is, what is, what do you, what is the meaning of this title, Lord? What comes to your mind when you think of that? Owner. What else? Master. Master. Sustainer. Mm -hmm. Sustainer. Anybody else? Hmm? King. King. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Sovereign. The one who has all the power. What's interesting about this title, the Lord, is how God chooses to describe himself of all the different ways he could have. He chooses to describe himself. <laughs> the burning bush. <laughs> um, th how God chooses to describe himself is a, is a name that describes his relationship to creation. Do you guys get what I'm saying? His name is a name that tells us what his relationship to the creation is. Um, Vladimir, can you check if I have uh, markers in my bag? Should be down there somewhere. I should just have some markers. Perfect. So we started with this creator-creature distinction, right? He is up here. The universe is up here. This is us. So the question is God and creation. What is the relationship, right? And so the interesting thing is God, in, in all the different ways that God could have de described himself, right? For example, if God, if God chose his name to be powerful, just hypothetically speaking, that name describes him, it describes his strength, it describes what God can accomplish. It doesn't necessarily describe his relationship to his creation. Does that make sense? The Lord is a title, it's a name that specifically describes how he relates to us creatures, who he is to us. So in many ways, this, this, this is the central name of all the Bible, and this central name is built around his relationship to his creatures. So because of that, Lord and covenant are inseparable because... His name as the Lord is as the, at the head of every covenant. So that's another really important idea to note here. This title, Lord. Who can, who can list off to me the biblical covenants? 
How many are there or what are they? Just, or just shout out the different ones. The, what are the covenants that we, that we know of in the Bible? Abraham, Noah. Noetic, Abrahamic. David. David, mm-hmm. Davidic. What else? In the fall with Eve and the uh, covenant with the serpent. Do we call that a covenant or do we call that more of a prophecy? It's a disruption of the original relationship. And so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a it, promise. right. It's a promise of how the covenant will be restored. So we have, we have Noah, we have Abraham, we have Moses, we have David, and then we have Jesus. the new covenant, Jesus. So in all these covenants, how God describes himself at the head of all those covenants. And if you look at the different passages, and again, quick side note, we're going to talk about a lot of biblical ideas today. We are not proving every biblical idea because to do that, we would have to list through hundreds of Bible verses. So I'm going through some Bible verses today and I'm giving you the, the bare bones, the nuggets of truth that you then go back to your Bibles and you test if, I said, if what I said was correctly. But... We're summarizing whole sections of the Bible. But if you look at the conversation with Noah, he, he, he calls himself the Lord in that covenant. If you talk about Moses and on Sinai, God describes himself this specific way, the Lord. If you talk about David, same thing. New covenant, same thing. So in all of the Bible, this is the, the central name of God, the Lord. And... Again, this name describes how he relates to us. So the amazing thing is that God, in his very nature, and we'll see this later, in his very nature, he is oriented toward a relationship with his creatures, which makes the biblical God completely unique. So the Lord, what does the Lord mean? Well, there's a few aspects of lordship. And we will look at three of them. So first of all, absolute control. So the specific here is this. God possesses and exercises the power to control all things. So when you look at scripture, when you look at all the different ways that we see, how does the Bible describe his relationship towards the universe? He has the power to control everything. And he exercises that power to the absolute fullest sense. So, just a couple of passages. Ephesians 1.11 is one of the most powerful, to-the-point passages about God's total control. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the Him, according to the purpose who, of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Lamentations 3, 37, 38. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord, again, the Lord, has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? So, he both possesses and exercises total control. So, and the other side thing, I think, as we're flying through this content as we're maybe breezing through it. Um, you don't necessarily have to try to remember every detail, but as we're looking at this picture of God, try to let this truth kind of fill in your whole canvas of the vision. You know, generally we say, oh Lord, it means he's in charge. But let's take some time and notice the specific detail that the Bible gives us about how he is in charge and why he is in charge and why one of the most important things that he wants us to know about himself is that he is in charge. So, when you look at absolute control, there's two, way, there's two aspects to it that you see, right? When we saw Ephesians 1.11, God controls the whole universe. God controls all the molecules and all the galaxies and all in everything. He is in control. God is exercising total power. But in specific, as we're talking about this relationship of Lord, within that whole creation order, there is 
um, there is us, right? Us as unique creatures created within his image. And so every aspect of his lordship has a specific and, and, and special application to us. So I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a general and a specific to every aspect. So in general, he controls. But in specific, notice, notice the story of Sinai with Moses, the beginning, the foundation of God's work with Israel. Notice how in that relationship, the only reason Israel could know God is because God literally came down onto the mountain and disclosed himself. So when you're talking about God's control, you're not just saying God is in control of all the planets and galaxies, the waves and the wind and the rain. When you look at God's relationship towards us as Lord, he is in control of his relationship toward us. If he doesn't open himself, we cannot know him. We cannot climb a ladder of intellect and smart ideas and get to know him. He reveals himself. So when you look at all of scripture, that's the pattern. Um, we had a sermon a few weeks back on Moses, uh, on Abraham, right? Dima talked about Abraham, how Abraham was in a pagan family and God disclosed himself to Abraham and said, walk before me, I am God. So he reveals himself to us. Without his self-revelation, we cannot know him. And he is the one who sets the terms of the covenant. So God comes down to Israel. Israel is a perfect uh, example, sample, but all the different covenants and all of his relationship to us works in the same way. He's the one who determines how do we know him. He's the one who determines the terms of the covenant. He says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God besides me. So, and, and I also want to, so there's three things I kind of want to emphasize in every characteristic. General, specific, and then the absolute. When you think about God's control and you look at the different Bible passages, and again, if you have a hunger to read more on this subject after we're done here, I can give you some really wonderful readings. But when you just survey the many, many different passages, the Psalms, the prophets, the Pentateuch, the, the epistles, the whole New Testament, and you talk about, and you look at, okay, how is God controlling though? You, you see over and over this emphasis that he is the Alpha and the Omega, that he controls all things, that every single detail of the universe is in his power, is in his reign. It's all summarized in that verse that we read earlier, Ephesians, he who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. And you, if you look at the biblical passages, it's really overwhelming how often you see this all things, all things, all, 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 all. His reign is totally, totally um, encompassing. His control is absolute. We live in a universe totally dominated by the power of God. Um, so, number two aspects of lordship is authority. So, not only does he have the power and exercise the power, but you have to think about God when you look at God as creator. He's the only one who has the authority. He has the right to control all things. This oftentimes runs against our ego, this idea, but who has the right to control the universe? Who has the right to set the terms? Who has the right to instruct everyone and everybody needs to shut up and listen? No one has that right except God alone. And he has that right and he exercises that right over his universe. So that's the other thing that we see in scripture all the time. Again, I'm just giving little tidbits, little nibbles of passages. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Why? For he founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the waters. So the psalmist is just reflecting on life and he says, all of this, all of this, it belongs to him. He owns it. He's the one who has the right. All of us, every breath, every cell, every neurotransmitter that 
flies around in our brains, every pump of blood, every inhale of oxygen, it all belongs to him. He owns it. So, what are the implications though? Because he is the supreme controller, he is the only one who evaluates creation. So, where do we get an evaluation of the world? You know, where do we get a true perspective of how things are, right? He's the one who governs. He is the one who owns, right? And when he created it all, he's the one who looks. There's nobody, there's no one else that has the authority to, to look at it and say, it's good. The only reason that we can look and say it is good is because we're following in the path of the maker, the one who says it is good. We can stand up and say whatever we want. It doesn't mean anything if it's outside the word, the perspective, the authority of the maker, right? So the specific way that this aspect of lordship applies to us. If we, if we just really realize his authority, his, or his word is our binding instruction and command. So again, as you look at, if, if you remember the whole story of Moses and Sinai, as it unfolds, God first discloses himself and says, I am the Lord. And then God instructs and says, you shall have no other gods before me. Because I have revealed myself and this exclusive claim that no other gods, there's no conversation of any idols, any gods. And if you understand how that applied to their culture and their time, that was a very radical claim because so many religions, so many gods, so many powers, right? As God reveals himself, he kind of brushes everything off the table, says there's nothing, there's no one, there's no other word. There's no other allegiance except mine. So, if this is true, if he is the Lord who possesses all authority, then it is impossible to separate love and obedience. Right? Jesus kept coming back to this and saying, why do you say that, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call yourself my disciples if you don't do what I say? It's impossible to separate love for God. It's, Im it's impossible to separate a knowledge of God. It's impossible to separate a relationship with God from obedience and submission. That is the entire posture of the creature to the creator. The entire posture is obedience, submission, and dependence. That is, that is the nature that we were created for. And also his authority, just like his other, just like his um, control, his authority is absolute. Probably the most difficult passage in the whole Bible where you can, where somebody can try to dispute God's authority um, is Job, right? Where Job is suffering and Job has done nothing wrong. And Job is asking God, why is this going on? Why is this happening to me? Job is challenging God. God, what is going on? What are you doing, right? And Job is not necessarily sinning. It, it says that in all the things that Job did, he didn't sin. So it's not that Job was rebelling, but Job was questioning and Job was struggling and Job was frustrated, right? So how does God answer? The Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered to the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. And Job says this a few times in the book. Now, oftentimes I think when we read this passage, we're just thinking, well, gosh, that's kind of rude. You know, Job is really struggling and Job is suffering and Job is asking an honest question. Why is this happening? And God just says, shut up, Job. You're not God. And Job says, okay, I'm sorry. Right? It's not really what's going on here. God comes down and says, hey, Job, do you want to question me? God just cracks a little bit of glory, of revelation to Job. God discloses himself a little more clearly to Job. And God says, hey, Job, 
do you want to question me? And Job shrinks into this position himself. When you see God, your, your questions, they're aligned, right? And at the end, we don't see Job frustrated anymore. But God never answered any of his questions. All God did was show Job his lordship. God just went on and on and said, hey, who sends out the lightning? Who causes the mountains and the rain to come down and the deer to give birth? Who causes this and that? Who controls this? Have you ever, you know, who created the oceans? God just, God just gives him a little bit of peek into his lordship, into his power and his glory and his relationship to the universe. And as Job sees God, his, all his frustrations, they're aligned. He says, I am a creature. You're a Lord. There's no questions here. So God's authority, it's absolute, and God, God's authority is unquestionable. Um, it's above every other voice. We heard that earlier. And it is for all of life. Notice, his authority is absolute. There is nothing, there is, no, there is no little dark little corner in the whole cosmos, in the whole universe, on any side planet of, of a side moon of a planet, under any single rock, there's no, no place where you can go to escape the authority of God, where you can just do whatever you want. His authority extends to all of life, to all of his creation, and to all of ourselves, and deep, deep, deep into all of our hearts. So we live in this Lord's universe. Our self-awareness, you know, it starts to realign as we look at God. Our view of life. We like to think that our life is ours. We like to think that we are in control. We like to think that we're in charge, that we have rights. In a way, we do have rights, but our rights are only properly seen in light of what he says about us. And until you see this vision, you see nothing. Moving right along. So all of life. So, he is Lord. Absolute control, absolute authority, and three, covenant presence. This is another aspect of his lordship, which I think is pretty amazing. So as Lord, he is not detached and separate and unreachable. The amazing thing about the biblical conception of God is that it has this perfect balance of what theologians call transcendence and imminence. Transcendence is the idea of how high and exalted he is, right? So God is transcendent above us. He, he is so high and so much bigger and mightier and holier than us. He's way above us. Imminence is, is the idea of closeness. And the biblical picture of God is absolute in transcendence, absolute in control and authority, but also absolute in imminence. From the very first pages of Genesis, we see this picture. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I mean, that's kind of a staggering thing. I mean, Moses opens the very opening lines of the Bible. He opens with this picture that this God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created them all, right? And this one little planet, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. So he is, he is a part. He, he made it. He spoke and the whole thing came. And then he is in it. And he is present. Notice the, again, just the thoughts of the psalmist here in 139. These words we've read a lot. Where shall I go from your spirit? And not only this, this is not just saying, you know, God is so high up there. It doesn't, you're like a little ant. You know, it doesn't matter where you run, he can see you, right? Notice what he's saying here. He says something more profound. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I free, flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall not bleed. Your hand shall lead me. It, it's not a typo. It's just, um, you know, little references in the Bible. Anyways, 
your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So notice what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, you can't escape God anywhere and he is everywhere and he is actually everywhere with a very distinct purpose. So like, like I said earlier, in general, he is everywhere. He is what we call in theology the word omnipresent. God is present everywhere at the same time. But he is not present everywhere at the same time in the same way. Right? So he is present in the universe in a general sense. But God is present with his people in a very specific and special way. So this whole process, this covenant unfolding, God discloses himself and then God claims authority and says, I am the Lord, you shall... And then he unfolds the law, right? So he gives them the law. This is the, they have to follow this instruction. He is the Lord. They have no other thing to do, right? But then God says, why? What's the point of all this? God says, I will be with you. And then God says, and gives them very detailed instructions on how to build a tabernacle at the very center. And he gives them very detailed instructions how to build their entire camp, all the different tribes centered around the tabernacle. And, he's, and God is trying to show them in every way possible that he wants to be with them. He wants to be among them. He wants to be their God, close and present, as close as possible. So he is everywhere. He's, you know, he's, he's on Jupiter and Pluto and the sun everywhere, right? In a general way. But he is with his people and with his creatures that he has created in, in a very special way. In his covenant presence. He is there to bless, to aid, to deliver, and to judge. So, the lordship, as we're, as we're seeing this full big picture of lordship, we, we, we want to see how total and absolute it is, right? We're, we're emphasizing absoluteness in three ways here. And he's absolutely present, too. He's, he's present in the most profound way. He's present with us even more than we are present with each other. So what does that mean? Well, it's absolute. So without him, there could be no meaning or significance or purpose to anything. Because God is present in his world, he did not, he's not like the, the old philosophers would say the blind wa the, the, the blind watchmaker or whatever he, he wound up the, the universe like a clock and walked away right it's just ticking along the universe is by itself no 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 no, no. the bible presents that he is upholding every single process and actually this is what makes life meaningful is his covenant presence his presence defines the significance of all of life because it is his world because he owns it, he upholds it, he made the leaves grow on the trees out there, and he gives us breath, and he makes the sun rise, and that's what gives everything significance. If he removes himself, it's just a machine, a meaningless machine. There's no significance, there's no point to anything. But the biblical God, he is everywhere with purpose. The other implication here is that he is the one with whom we have most to do. So we worry, you know, about our relationship with our boss. That's a big deal. We worry about our relationship to our wife, maybe, especially on weeks that we've done something or maybe we spent money in a way we shouldn't spend. Or if you're not married, if you're a kid here, you're worried about your relationship with your parents, especially when you did something bad, it's a big deal. Your, your relationship with your parents, especially on the day when you're in, 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 um, in trouble, that relationship defines everything else, right? When you're tr in trouble. Um, I mean, same thing with if you have problems at work and you're scared, right? You go everywhere. You, you leave work. You clock out. You leave, but you're still worried. You're wondering about what is the boss going to say or whatever, right? So, so relationships, they have this tendency to, to, to fill our lives. But we have to realize that because he is Lord and he is covenantally present with his creation, that he is the one with whom we have most to do. That, that, is the, that all of life is before the face of God. We walk and live and breathe 
before His presence. We answer to Him. There's an old Latin phrase, I think, all of life is quorum Deo, before the face of God. So more than anything, more important than anything, is our knowledge of Him, our love of Him, and our obedience to Him. This, this relationship, this sense of the transcendent Lord who controls all things, and yet He is present right here before us. We are before His glory. We, he sees us. He knows us. We don't escape Him ever. That sense defines our lives. And there's nothing more important. You can, be do, you can be succeeding in all of life, right? But if, 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 you, if you are cut off from the Creator, if you are in rebellion to the Maker, it doesn't matter what you are or what you're doing. If you are living in light of your Creator, if you are living in love and re- relationship and covenant and obedience to the Maker, it doesn't matter what other troubles come at you in, in, in other parts of life. He is Lord who controls all things. So this idea is supposed to sink deep into our hearts. So, practical conclusions. You have survived session one. Lordship. In every way, we want to see this. We want, we want to not just inter- understand it intellectually. We want, to, we want to pass this truth through our hearts to feel it through that God's lordship is absolute. That God's Lordship is absolute. The other thing that we want to see about this truth is really quickly you want to start, you, we start to see how this is a very unpopular idea. This, this idea of Lordship is at the heart of how God relates and reveals Himself in the Bible. And this is the one probably most hated idea about God by people within Christianity or who call themselves Christians and people who are outside of Christianity, right? Lordship crushes our pride. It has to crush our pride. If your pride is not crushed and destroyed, then you have not understood what this truth is saying. It's supposed to, it's, it's a glorious kind of crushing though, right? Because it's the kind of destroying that builds you up in the most powerful way. To know that all of life is before the face of God. The other thing that's really important, I think, when you consider lordship, and especially from a New Testament lens, that Jesus is the exalted Lord, the Savior who is Lord, is that it gives us confidence and courage in the face of difficulty. So he is, not just, he is not just Lord. He is Lord who is covenantally present and with us who are his children through Jesus. He has covenanted himself. He has spilled his blood to give us life and we are his children and now he infuses our lives and to build his kingdom through us. He sends us out. He, 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 he instructs us to live our lives, to build our families, to love our kids, to instruct them with the truth, to build our homes, to love our wives, to love our neighbors, to work hard. Right? He sends us out into this world as His covenant people, and He sends us with Himself living inside of us. And, and it's going to be difficult, but when you understand Lordship, when you understand that He is in charge, it gives you courage and confidence. It doesn't mean you're going to stomp your boot on the face of every enemy because the story of the New Testament, the the trajectory, the the, the promise is you will suffer. That's the promise. It it doesn't mean that, oh, the Lord, you know, you know, out of my way. Actually, you're going to suffer, but through your suffering, His victory will be magnified even more. So it gives us courage. It gives us confidence in obedience. And in a specifically man-oriented way here, God's Lordship helps us raise mature men. It helps us raise boys who become men because only when you understand Lordship can you have a proper balance of humility and strength as a man, right? So I want to read this quick quote uh, from Doug Wilson on this exact, exact idea. Really great. The only way to accomplish this balance is through a grasp of who God is. Because we have, 
these teachings, wait, see, my, my, uh, sorry, because we have the teaching that God is our Father with the attributes of a divine Father, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, something happened with my quote here. I'm trying to see what, what it said originally. Because we have lost the teaching that God is our Father with the attribute of divine Father who lost understanding, oh, jeez. I'm trying to reconstruct the sentence. Because of this, our boys suffer in two different directions, right? Either you embrace humility without boldness. If you want to be a humble guy and not be bold and just be a, a, a pushover. Or you embrace boldness without humility and you become destructive. So if you're a man who wants to be bold and not humble, you will be destructive. You will be foolish. You think you're strong, but you're not. You're just gonna break stuff. You're gonna break people, you're gonna break yourself. If you wanna be humble, but not bold, you're gonna be, a, you're gonna be effeminate, you're gonna be girly, you're gonna be a pushover. You're not gonna be able to stand for the truth. The only way to have this balance of boldness and humility is to know the Lord. Is to know that in light of the creator-creature distinction, in light of who the Lord is, I am a creature. I depend 100% on him. Without his breath in my lungs, without his grace in my heart, I am a fool, right? So you're humble, but at the same time, you are strong because you say, and yet God's grace is in me. And he calls me to obey. And he calls me to proclaim Jesus. And he calls me to raise my family and raise my church and raise my community in his glory. And he gives you boldness and strength. But it's a boldness that is, that is corrected by humility in the face of God. So boldness without humility is destructive. Humility without boldness is effeminate. Yeah, something happened with converting to Microsoft. It completely like... Anyways, Microsoft and Mac don't, don't like each other. So, Lordship, questions, comments before we take a break? I like it. You like it? <laughs> Approved. <laughs> Can you comment on the question, I think the classic question that, for example, when Job saw God's glory and his lordship, it was enough for him. But often today we hear this question, can we claim that this lord is good lord in, mm -hmm. in the light of everything that's happening? You know? For some reason for Job, when he saw the you know, glory and majesty of this lord, he said, okay, it makes sense. But for people... If we claim that he's in control and he, you know, he's this great Lord, how powerful that he allows kids to suffer, famine, disasters, how can we reconcile that with the idea of Lord being Lord, uh -huh. able to stop that, but he's not stopping? Yeah. That's because we quickly answer with, okay, Christ died for you, and all of this has happened because of sin. Right. But for Job specifically, was he seeing the goodness of God that it's not mentioned in the book of Job? Or mm -hmm. and how can we pass that on to the people who's asking? Well, who defines what good is? If he, if he is the maker and lord, he defines what good is. And I think we come to God with that question with preconceived standards of our own. And we say, well, no, God needs to do this in order for this to be good. And we give him the definition of what good is. I mm -hmm. think it's, um, I, I think it, it's a difficult thing to reconcile with because we are creatures and we have the ability to think, but I think we oftentimes make up the definitions of what God should be filling up. Right. It, it, <clears throat> and just to like, just to say it also a different way is, what do we deserve? What do those children deserve? They're sinners. What do we deserve? We all deserve death and punishment. There is a grace in us living, in us breathing. Yeah, but still inescapably, you, you, you struggle with the question of if this Lord is good, then why did he allow so much suffering? And that, you don't want to, the, the worst thing you can do to that question of the problem of evil, if God is powerful and good and there's so much evil, the worst thing you can do, I think, is to downplay the question and to say it's not that big of a deal because he's good. 
um, because it is a big deal. Because it's the most difficult question in Christianity. Actually, not just Christianity. I think the problem of evil is probably the most difficult question you can ever ask. So, um, and I think Victor's, Victor, you want to add anything? Because he's yeah. probably more qualified than I am to say because he did a whole paper on it. Yeah. But, no, you know, a couple, couple comments is, you know, this is a very challenging question. You know, looking into various people, like Armenians answer a certain way, Calvinists have a little groups of people answer different ways. Um, you know, there, there's various facets, you know. But I, I, honestly, you know, oftentimes I think when we answer this question, like Victor, the way Victor answered, it, it, isn't a, it is a correct answer. But I think oftentimes we, we, by saying that, we're saying that their difficulty or the pain that they experience is not that difficult. Um, and I think that's where you say, you know, God is in control and we sometimes don't know why God allows this. We just know he allows it. But he is in your suffering with you. He is there. He is the hope. He is, he is the one that is there for you to run. He didn't just... Somehow this happened and there's no hope. There is hope. There is someone to come to, you know? Because oftentimes people say, well, what about the shooting that happened in the theater and people lost their lives? Where was God there, you know? And, and honestly, you can't just say, well, he's in control. Well, yes, he's in yeah. control. And, and, and you can't say stuff like, where is America? This is, you know, yeah, yeah. where is God? He's always there. But, the, but America has turned her back on the yeah, Lord. Yeah. So, so that doesn't... You present God as, as the Bible presents it. And yet you also present God as a loving God who's there, who's the hope, who heals in the time of difficulty and need. You have to, you have to answer this question in a bigger sense that God is in control. You talk about sin, I think, because sin is a problem. That's what causes all these difficulties. God is over that. Yet God is, you know, it's, a, it's not a, like a here's the answer. It, mm -hmm. it has multiple facets to that. Yeah, I think... Right. So in a nutshell, also, you, this question is really impossible, actually, for everyone. And I think people who are anti-Christian like to whoop out the question as if it's a Christian problem. The problem of evil is the most difficult question for any religion or any worldview. Because if you're an atheist, you have a whole different problem. If you're an atheist and there is no God and evil is, is just a figment of our imagination, then you have to try to convince yourself that evil is not actually real. So I think one thing is just to realize, look, it's not just a Christian problem, it's, it's an everybody problem. But the Christian God, the Christian story answers this question very uniquely because the Christian story is that he is Lord who is transcended, but he is also Lord who is completely, totally imminent. He is a covenant Lord. He is present with us. And what that means is that he is the God who has gone so far to be present with us in our suffering that he has entered our world as flesh and blood. And he has actually taken all of the weight of the suffering and all of the terrible things that we have created with our sin and he has chosen to pour that upon himself so that he could save us from that wrath. So this story of, so in the Christian story, the question changes a little bit because you, it's not even, when you look at it from the gospel perspective, the, change, the question changes because it's not just how could God, how could a good God create a universe where people struggle or suffer? The question is, why would a perfect good God create a universe where he would suffer? But the God of the gospel is the God who has created the universe that he knew he's going to suffer in there in order to save us. Why would he do that? It shows you something about his nature. I was going to say, a lot of times when we look at and sin, we look at, the, look at God as on one side of the fence, or on one side of the story that there's God, and then there's our sin, and then there's this kind of, there's this attack that going, you know, against, but we have to understand that God is on every single aspect of the, of the world that he has created. He is, in, he is the God who is wrathful against sin, but then he is the God that's receiving the, 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 the wrath 
He is the God that is in the in the midst carrying the wounded. Uh -huh. So when you see God on one side, yes, you're saying, how could God allow this? If you're saying he's so good, but he's so far. But if you look at God, he, he, he transcends through all aspects of life. And then when you see it from the, from the side where God carries you because of the str struggles that you're dealing with or that you've created, you see a God completely different. So to say that God is this, per this kind of God because of these circumstances, we're not seeing the full picture. We're not realizing the full God that is fully involved in every aspect mm -hmm. of sin and the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted to note is that the answer was more of like, why, why is this even okay? Why is this allowed? Well, first of all, because he's God. But if the question is, um, well, how can, how can he do that? Well, there's a there's a take in like a, in theological circles about Book of Job, and one of them is basically to explain that. The book of Job isn't just like Andre was saying how it's like, okay, you think you can ask me anything? Well, you really can't because I'm so in charge. Actually, the book of Job wasn't to explain away evil. It was to say, I got you. I'm mm. your father. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. I'm right here. It's, just, it's to say that, like, yes, I don't need to give you an explanation right now why this is happening you don't understand it all but i need you to know that i'm in control and i'm sovereign it's it and i think that's the answer to those questions it, it isn't that well you can't ask that because you're just a person right the answer is he got you right and that's, and that's what the book of job is about is is this he sees it he doesn't just say like oh he's so amazing i can't even come to him it's more to be like okay he is my father. I, right. He's in control. And right. I think that's how we should respond. Like when people, like I was, was Mark Dever actually was saying that a friend of his that had something horrible happen to his family. Somebody either died or something happened. And he said, you know, I, knowing the the God's supremacy and everything, I, I sat with him and I cried with him. I didn't have to tell him, God is in control, God is going to hold this and make this happen. You know, He said, you know what, I was moved and I was crying with him. He said, even though I know God's sovereignty, I know this, but I'm moved with this person. So oftentimes we try to answer like very disconnected from, well, God is in control, you just have to submit. That is true, but God is in this problem, in this mess with you. Right. We, that's how you should technically answer it. Because people, that's what people are looking for, is God is like, zapping everybody who he wants to. No, God is in control, but yet look at the bigger picture of who he is. Right. Moses, were you going to add something? So I think a lot of the times, too, we forget that there is a, a timeline that is based on God's time. Um, a lot of the times, like, we see suffering, the world, we see injustice happening, and we're like, why is there nothing happening now? Mm -hmm. You know, in light in terms of, of like the timeline of humanity, but the Bible promises that at, in the end Christ will reconcile all things to Himself, and every knee will bow to Him. You know, regardless of their disposition of who He was. So when Christ returns, um, all the justices that will, all the injustices will be served justice because that will be the day of judgment. Like. <laughs> When, when we ask, you know, why is there so much suffering, why is God allowing this? It's because there's a period of time that God is allowing it to happen mm -hmm. so that he can place proper judgment upon what happens in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, right, so, and, and one of the ways that people try to, one of the ways we make sense of this question is, is all this pain and suffering worth it? That's really the question. And we are, as human creatures, we are not in the place to answer that question. We don't know, we, we cannot know the answer to that question, not because he doesn't let us, but because it's like trying to explain to your two-year-old, you know, why you have to go to work in the morning. I mean, he, he, just, he just doesn't get it, right? It, these questions are above his capacities. Um, in the same way, it is God trying to answer us how he's running the universe. And the short answer is, and the answer is a question. The question is, given what you know about God, can you, is he worthy of your trust even when you don't know the answer? That, and that's the whole point, I think, what Victor was saying also. 
And that's where we take that question. I think with Job, that's what happens, right? Exactly what Victor's saying. Um, God opens himself to Job and shows his glory. And, and as Job sees who he is, Job says, you're in charge. I know you're in charge. You know, it's not that Job was shut up. It's that Job was answered. But the answer was much deeper than he was even asking. The question isn't, why, why, am, why is my life messed up? Why, why not my life? Why not my neighbors? It doesn't, right? The question is, is this Lord, is this Lord who is master of all things, is he worthy of my trust? And that's a personal question. When you're going through really hard things, that's the central question you ask yourself. Is God, in the middle of all this, when I don't know the answer to my pain, is God worth, worthy of my trust? And, and can I cling to him like a child clings to a father, a child that does not understand what is going on, right? So quick little quote and we go for break. This is, this is our brother Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, brother, I mean like, you know, Russian, I don't know. <laughs> I think he's a Christian. He says this, he says, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all the hearts, for the comforting of all the resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, for all the blood that they've shed, and that it will make not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. So he's saying, I believe that at the end, it will all be harmonized and it will all be made clear that it's all worth it, that it all made sense. But the question is, is he worthy of your trust today? So let's take 10 minutes and we'll be back for part two. We have, guys, it gets even better. It gets even better. Oh, yeah.